J. Lewis, Vice President of Public Affairs, Association of Clinical Research Organizations, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, and good afternoon. I commend the United States International Trade Commission for this time and hearing, and note that as we speak, FDA Commissioner Peggy Hamburg uh, is in the middle of her visit to India, where she is addressing some of the issues we are discussing today. ACRA represents the world's uh, eight largest clinical research organizations, uh, which account for about two-thirds of the industry revenue globally. Our member companies work on behalf of pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device companies, companies like Roy's members, uh, supplying much of the infrastructure for drug development today. Annually, we conduct more than 11,000 clinical trials involving more than 2 million, 2 million participants in 115 countries. So we have a broad and unique perspective on the topic of how clinical research is conducted globally and the regulatory apparatus that is in place to support this important activity. We estimate our members have conducted approximately two-thirds of the industry-sponsored clinical trials in India. Collectively, we've invested in excess of $100 million in the country, building out research infrastructure and training several thousand employees across approximately two dozen facilities. Unlike many of the other industries represented at this hearing, CROs are not directly impacted by intellectual property concerns as we rarely have ownership interest in the product we are testing nor are we necessarily concerned with drug pricing policies. Our primary focus is with regulatory policies, or lack thereof, that make conducting clinical research in India extremely difficult, if not impossible, at this time. Our members have been seriously impacted by the confusing, inconsistent, and at times arbitrary application of regulations regarding clinical research. We have seen the activity drop in excess of 60% between 2010 and 2013, and the vast majority of ongoing trials were approved prior to 2013, as Roy alluded to. Uh, this data is supported by clinicaltrials.gov, which is a proxy for global research. According to clinicaltrials.gov, in 2010, the peak of activity in India, 256 industry-sponsored clinical trials were being conducted in the country. By 2013, this number had dropped to 86. Very few new trials have been approved in the past year, and several CROs and biopharmaceutical companies have chosen to abandon India as a locus for clinical research. I'll provide specific examples later. Ultimately, CROs have two responsibilities, to protect the safety of patients through the ethical conduct of the research, and to ensure the integrity of the data gathered during the clinical research process so the proper scientific and regulatory reviews may take place. Several conditions must be present for us to comfortably execute our duties, high among them strong and predictable regulatory infrastructure. Unfortunately, this does not exist in India today. ACRA members were early entrants into the Indian market with great expectations for clinical research in the country. With a large population, a high disease burden, and a large number of well-trained clinical investigators, India was clearly positioned take a prominent role in clinical research alongside the more established regions of North America, Europe, and Japan. First, allow me to take a step back for a moment and explain why it is so important to conduct clinical trials globally, besides the fact that disease knows, knows, knows no boundaries and drugs are developed for patients all around the world. Based on ACRO research, if we were to conduct a hypothetical phase three cancer trial only in the United States, it's the pivotal trial that is needed seek regulatory approval. That trial would take nearly six years based on the population of the U.S., the incidence of cancer, and the participation rate of cancer patients in clinical trials. Holding that participation rate steady, the same trial could be conducted in less than two years if we access a global population. The bottom line is a new medicine could be made available to patients markedly sooner, in this example, nearly four years. So the case for globalized research is clear. This is why the current situation in India is so troubling. Not only is the health of the Indian people and the Indian economy suffering, the U.S. and Indian companies are unable to conduct life-saving biomedical research and global health is suffering. Unfortunately, clinical research has become a highly politicized topic in India, fueled, at least in part, by a sensationalistic press. For instance, we have seen headlines proclaiming a shocking number of deaths in clinical trials in India. Yet these articles lack all context and rarely note that few of the deaths are actually caused by participation in the trial versus, for instance, reflecting the number of terminally ill patients, such as late stage cancer patients, who may gain a few extra months of life through participation in the trial. In reality, 
deaths directly attributable to something going wrong in the clinical trial are extremely rare, a fact confirmed by scientific inquiries made by the Indian government. The politicians seized on these incorrect claims of deaths and injuries in clinical trials and began to apply pressure to regulators to crack down on clinical trials. As a result, Indian regulators have published a number of draft regulations and guidances addressing such issues as the reporting of serious adverse events, improving the informed consent process, and establishing methods to compensate patients in the rare occurrence of injury caused by participation in the trial. On behalf of the CRO industry, ACRO has provided constructive input to these proposals using the formal comment process, direct discussions with Indian regulators and government officials, and working through organizations such as the USIGC, from whom you heard earlier. Among the many possible new regulations that have been proposed, I should note that India is one of the few countries to pursue direct oversight of CROs through a registration, through a registration process. The first draft regulations were issued in 2009 and the subsequent draft in 2011. ACRO has been supportive of these efforts to ensure that only qualified and reputable CROs conduct clinical trials in India. To date, however, these regulations have not been finalized. While it is entirely appropriate and reasonable for the Indian government to construct a framework of regulatory expectations and oversight, the actual language of regulations and guidances that have been proposed has been inconsistent with accepted global standards and at times shocking, shockingly lacking in scientific rigor. The result has been a chilling effect on clinical research in the country. Notably, I will reference an example from the proposed guidance on compensation in the case of trial-related serious adverse events of death, the content of which offered no adequate mechanisms to address such key issues as how to determine the cause of the injury, the responsible party, the appropriate amount of compensation, or any appeal mechanism. Uh, I will note with Mr. Simchak on this panel that in most countries this is um, addressed through an insurance process that does not exist in India. Even more troubling, early versions of the proposed regulation would hold a sponsor or CRO financially responsible if, for example, a placebo administered in a trial, which is a standard practice in a randomized controlled trial, did not have a therapeutic effect. Of course, the placebo should not, and by definition cannot, have a therapeutic effect. Similarly, the sponsor or CRO could have been financially liable if the new drug being tested did not have the intended therapeutic effect. Of course, the entire reason to conduct the trial is to determine the efficacy of a new drug. Even prior to this guidance, CROs and sponsor companies had come under pressure from the Drugs Controller General of India and the Health Ministry to pay compensation claims without clear evidence of injury, causation, or responsibility. In very direct terms, these companies were informed that compensation would be paid promptly or their licenses to do business in the country would be suspended. To be clear, ACRA members are committed to conducting safe, ethical, high-quality clinical research across the globe. But these are scientific investigations, and in the rare instances where a patient suffers a serious adverse event or death, we stand willing to take appropriate responsibility. But to do that, researchers and research companies must depend on a regulatory framework that is reasonable and rooted in science not politics. Regulatory consistency and certainty are key to both the science and business of clinical trials. And yet, at this moment, it is not even clear who has regulatory authority over clinical trials in India, because in January of 2013, the Supreme Court of India revoked the powers of the Drugs Controller General and asked the Ministry of Health to monitor trials. Some impact of these inconsistent and poorly constructed regulations was to send a very clear signal that clinical research was not welcome in India. The clinical research enterprise has responded as one might expect. In July of last year, the National Institutes of Health announced that it was canceling or suspending some 40 clinical trials in India. In October of last year, one of our members, Quintiles, the largest CRO in the world with a 15-year history of operating in India, announced that it was closing its phase one research unit in Hyderabad, citing, quote, a challenging external business environment. Notably, this unit was a joint venture with a large Indian company, Apollo Hospice. And just last month, AstraZeneca, which I realize is not a U.S. company, but is representative example of pharma industry, announced it was closing its research center in Bangalore. To be sure, U.S. companies are being harmed by these policies, but the reality is we can relocate our research to more hospitable countries in Eastern Europe or China or elsewhere, mitigating somewhat the direct economic damage. The real loss is to the global research environment that is critical to the official, uh, efficient development of new treatments and therapies for patients in need in the U.S., in India, and around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I want to express appreciation to all the witnesses for taking time to 
come today.